here on the corner is marked off by caution tape. They've also blocked the alley. There are still about five police cars here. We also have a crime scene unit not too long ago. There were also firefighters here, but they have since left the scene. The fire, the police officer I spoke to said this is still very early on. They couldn't confirm a lot of details, but we have seen, we've seen different flashes going off behind us in the backyard there, so they are investigating. They can't say right now if any foul play is suspected, but we're going to stay here. We're going to follow this story and bring you all the latest updates. But for now, live in Davenport, Grace Runkel, Local 4 News. Grace, thank you again. Two people found dead at the bottom of a pool at a home on Jersey Ridge Road in the village of East Davenport. Grace, thank you. No mercy. Mercer County School District Superintendent is in legal trouble tonight after a DUI arrest in Scott County over the weekend. Court documents show Eldridge police arrested 52 year old Scott Petrie Saturday night. Police say he had no registration or proof of insurance and that he failed to pull over for officers initially. Petrie posted bond Sunday morning and is due in court tomorrow. Local 4 News contacted Mercy County School Board President Julie Wagner for comment. Wagner said, quote, the school board is aware of the situation and looking into it. Since this is a personnel issue, we cannot comment further at this time. A warning tonight from Iowa's Department of Natural Resources about wastewater in Davenport. Public Works responded to an odor complaint and found some tainted water seeped into Silver Creek near Covington Drive. A sewage pipe eroded and broke. The area is heavily wooded and not easy to access, so it might take a few days to repair. Silver Creek flows into Duck Creek and through several parks before reaching the Mississippi River. The DNR recommends keeping kids and pets away from that area. River Action is working to protect itself and other downtown Davenport buildings from more flooding. It's teaming up with the city of Davenport to create a permeable alley behind its building on River Drive. That area is prone to take on water during heavy rain and significant flooding. It'll be three feet deep and filled primarily with gravel. River Action's executive director tells Local 4 News cameras will be installed so you can see it in action. Davenport's Flood Task Force meets again tomorrow night to address concerns and come up with solutions after the record flood of 2019. It's being moved to a larger location because the crowd at the last meeting was too big for the space. Tomorrow's meeting will be at the main library and lower level conference room from 4 to 530. Local Forest Community Spotlight shines on Maquoketa, Iowa this week. Tonight, we take a look at the Maquoketa Caves. It's a state landmark with beauty and history that draws thousands of hikers a year to it. Local Forest Yukari Nakayama reports what makes the caves special. On a hot day when it's 93 and you just can't get any comfort, you go in the cave and it's just uh, like being in a walk-in cooler. For hikers, families, and nature lovers, the Maquoketa State Park's 16-plus caves serve as the main attraction. It's not as muddy as the other side caves, so it, it's, it's a draw there to have fun and stay clean. And these caves are unlike any others in the country. So we're not as glorious as some of the other caves you go to because our caves are unique that you don't have to have a guide. You can go through them on your own. You can touch the wall. You go crawling through the caves. Today, the Maquoketa Cave State Park encompasses over 300 acres of land. In the early 1800s, the caves were accidentally rediscovered by hunters Joshua Bear and David Scott. And they went hunting through the woods and they found this deer. Um, the deer ran into the caves and they waited for their deer to come back. You know, they went into the caves later on to find it and they realized that the deer had actually run all the way through the cave. So that was kind of when the caves were rediscovered. That's when the history of the caves emerged. Artifacts such as stone tools and pottery were all found on the ground. Archaeologists tying that back to prehistoric Native Americans. So the uh, Native Americans were in this area. Um, the Sac and the Fox, just from our records and what we know, they were here. They were hunters, farmers, and nomads. Some of these artifacts can be found at the Sagers Museum on site. The caves became a popular place for picnics and family outings. And in the late 1920s, a woman named Mrs. A.J. House helped it become what it is today. We became a state park in 1933. Um, that's when we officially became a park, and then since then, uh, that was the first little piece of land they've added things since then. Making the Maquoketa Caves a cool spot on a hot day. In Maquoketa, Yukari Nakayama, Local 4 News. A quaint little bar with one big burger. Tomorrow night at 10, we head to Springbrook to try the 10-ounce burger at Geronimo's. 
Our week in Jackson County wraps up Friday. The Jackson County Fair will be out there live during our 5 and 6 o'clock newscast. Come by and say hi when you see us. Chief Meteorologist Andy McRae is here now. We'll be out there again on Friday, and we hope some weather cooperates. Yeah, temperatures will we be... love it now. I guess it depends on how you want to look at it. It'll be <laughs> cooler than it was last week. That's not saying a lot. It'll be a little warmer than it was today. So a I little warmer is okay. Yeah, because it was nice today. The temperatures, they're really only part of the story, too. You know, the humidity was way down, so it felt good with that high of 84 today. I'll be back with a forecast for the rest of the week here in a couple of minutes on Local 4 News at 10. First, though, a quick look at the closing numbers on Wall Street for Monday. WHBF is local for you with Jim Needleman, Chief Meteorologist Andy McRae, and Sports Director Jay Kidwell. This is Local 4 News at 10 in high definition. Hey, Kelly, depending on time, I wouldn't have them wrap up that live shot. We could maybe hit them in the E block and drop the lights for child vote side if it's depending if we get it. Do, do they know do they know to stay out there? OK. Oh, cool. Now, Chief Meteorologist Andy McRae with your local pinpoint forecast. It was just a dynamite sunset earlier in the Quad Cities. Here's what it looked like from about 400 feet up above the ground. We were getting rid of the cumulus clouds. The sunset was around 830, but we had some really pretty colors out there for about an hour this evening. And now, of course, it's dark outside after 10 o'clock, but very pretty out there earlier this evening and pretty comfortable, too, especially compared to that weather we had late last week. There's a live look right now, a little bit of traffic on the Centennial Bridge, but it's a quiet and a dry and a fine Monday night. This comfortable weather that we've had over the last day or so, it sticks around. Low humidity early this week with a lot of sunshine. It does turn warmer by the weekend. We're in the upper 80s Saturday. We should hit 90 Sunday, so there is some warmer weather on the horizon. It is still July after all, but nice to catch a break after that big time heat and humidity last week. Well, right now it's 72, but the dew point is 54. In Davenport, it's 65 with that dew point of 54. When you have readings, dew point readings in the 50s around this time of the night, that's a pretty good indication that your low temperature will end up in the 50s later tonight after midnight, and I do think that'll be the case tonight. It's 68 in Muscatine, 66 in Alito, 63 in Galesburg, 61 in Clinton, so a lot of 60s on the board tonight. Time for that dog walking forecast. Last week it was kind of tough on dogs because the pavement temperatures on those really hot days, some of the sidewalks, some of the streets, they were about 130 degrees, believe it or not. So not easy dog walking weather last week, but hey, look at this. Bella and Maya and Layla, they're ready to go for tomorrow. 
And we have pretty good weather coming up for dog walking tomorrow. A lot of sunshine. We're in the 60s for a little bit, then the 70s, then the 80s. The sidewalk in the street, it'll be a little bit hotter, but it will not be as hot as it was last week. So some good news there. Clear skies tonight. You'll see a lot of stars if you happen to peek out the if you happen to peek out the window and those clear skies that hang around for the majority of the next couple of days. Futurecast does not indicate any really good chances for rain here in the near future. Instead, it'll be quite the opposite. Mostly sunny skies for several more days. Here's your local pinpoint forecast tonight. We're in the 50s for the first time in more than a month. It'll feel good outside tomorrow morning. It'll feel good tomorrow afternoon too on a mostly sunny and pleasant day. Now the seven day forecast temperatures will slowly creep up a little later in the week. Nothing crazy though. Humidity is low for now. There'll be a little more of that later in the week too, but overall it's a pretty decent July week coming up. And then we do have the chance for showers and storms next Monday and Tuesday. By then, a lot of us will need some rain. A lot of us already do, believe it or not. After all that wet weather the first half of the year, now July is below normal. And when you have below normal rain and a lot of sunshine and those really hot temperatures, things have dried up pretty quickly here lately. More drying in the days to come. Didn't seem like it took very long, did it? Yeah, it, we turned the corner pretty quickly on that. For the year, there's still an annual, still a surplus of almost 10 inches, but we're eating away at that extra budget that we've had just each and every day. Now. All right, Andy, thanks. Coming up, what is not so different this season for the Big Ten football teams and who moves on after a manic Monday of playoff baseball? Jay Kidwell gets to all of it on Local 4 News at 10. C3 just changed the inning to 13 from 12 to 13. Thank you. And now, from the GreenFamilyAuto.com Sports Desk, here's Jay Kidwell. Well, Logan Gluba had a tremendous game-tying home run in the seventh inning on Friday night as the West Falcons defeated Clinton 7-6 to six in eight innings. That was the fifth straight win for the Falcons. They are on a tear. West with 20 wins on the season, going for win number 21 Monday night in their second round game against Cedar Rapids Prairie. First inning, here comes your first Falcon highlight, and it comes courtesy of the catcher, Dominic De La Paz. What an arm, what a throw, cut, stealing. Falcons ready to go to the plate. They scored a run in that bottom of the first. Then in the second, well, Dominic's brother, Leo De La Paz, with the strikeout and things looking good for West. 
Bottom of the second, Falcons up one nothing, looking for more. The pitch gets away. Adam Good on third base, runs on in, no trouble at all. And the Falcons with a 2-0 lead in the second. Third inning, Prairie making some noise. Couple of runners on. This ball is going to the wall in left field. That is going to score two runs for Prairie. That is part of a three-run inning for them. They had a 3-2 lead on the Falcons. West, though, coming back. It's Adam Good with a base hit. Oh, put on the brakes. We got runners on the corners. However, the Falcons would not be able to score that inning. Logan Gluba and company, boy, what heart and hustle they showed. But in the end, it's Prairie moving on with the 6-2 victory over the West Falcons. Central DeWitt Sabres hosting West Delaware. The Hawks tonight in district bas baseball. How about Henry Bloom? Uh, come, hitting it hard. That's an error. It brings in a run. Central DeWitt uh, on the board and trying to make some more noise, and they would keep it going. Devin Hurdle, RBI single, and Central DeWitt down 3-2 after two innings. Lucas Bixby was fine on the mound, and then... Alec McAleer coming up with the base hit, and things are looking good for DeWitt. Down a run, runner on, and then Tucker Kinney is going to hit this one towards first. It's going to be an RBI ground out as the Sabres would tie things up 3-3 in the fifth inning. And then Garrett Finley with the throw to second. You are out. Scoreboard time. They're going to the 13th inning. They're all tied 3-3. Other games on this busy, busy Monday, Assumption Baseball. They win 2-1 to one at Washington. How about Pleasant Valley? 10-9 winners over City High. Assumption Softball wins 3-2 in their state quarterfinal game. Wapolo falls 6-0 in Fort Dodge. And Rock Island Post 200 wins their tournament as they beat Limestone 5-1. And Rock Island Post 200 going to the state tournament in Barrington. Congrats to them. Just ahead, Big Ten coaches on the stability in the con conference this summer. And the Bandits at home playing the Hot Rods. That's all on the way. You're watching Local 4 News at 10. I don't know whether we're going to need it or not. Thank you. I'm hoping I don't. But.
WHBF is local for DeWitt and local for you. This is Local 4 News at 10. Well, Kirk Ferentz has seen his share of coaches in the Big Ten Conference, no doubt about it, 21 years at Iowa. But this season, all of the coaches on the west side, well, they're all staying the same. Recently, Adam Rosso caught up with all these coaches at Big Ten Media Days, and he tells us how the fact that they've got the stability and how that might impact their coaching decisions. Sell took a pause this offseason. Well, I'm fired up for the coaches that we didn't have any changes. You know, that's good for the profession. With the same seven coaches returning to the sidelines for the first time since 2014. It means that uh, there's really good coaches in this league and there's great support and the teams are winning you know, on this side in this division. So how does the coaching consistency alter preparation for the division opponents? Minnesota's P.J. Flex says preparing for a first-year coach is actually less complicated because the new system isn't completely installed. They're going to be probably simpler because they're, they're just seeing who can do it. I think when guys have been there longer, it's harder because maybe what you see on film is fool's gold. They're not even going to do that because they have so much in the repertoire over so many years. Longtime Northwestern coach Pat Fitzgerald agrees. <laughs> he says veteran coaches are difficult to scheme because the good ones are constantly evolving. Obviously, I think everybody changes their team based on their personnel, and so you'll see changes from everybody even though, uh, you, you know, there's not any changes from a standpoint of, uh, their coaches. Change is inevitable. You know, everybody improves, everybody gets better, everybody throws things out, adds things, makes things better. All with the same goal of winning a division title and taking their teams to Indianapolis and the Big Ten Championship. We're always looking and trying to game plan and get better. I mean, you, you've got to beat this, the teams on your side of the conference. So, uh, yes, we've done extensive studies and, uh, you know, whoever does the small things right and makes the most big plays will win. Reporting from Chicago, Adam Rosso for Hawkeye Headquarters. Thank you, Adam. The River Bandits wrapped up their series this afternoon with the Bowling Green Hot Rods. These two, two of the top teams in the entire Midwest League. River Bandits had the most wins in the league. The Hot Rods the third most. And a big hello to Grace, Max, and Mason. We got a wave. We got a glove. We got a baseball. That crew means business. And we're still waving. That is absolutely priceless. Oh, great pitching by the River Bandits. Jonathan Bermudez, Hunter Martin, Garrett Gale. Well, they kept the hot rods off the board. Bermudez with five strikeouts in six innings. Fourth inning, Romero Rodriguez, base hit to right field. And the Bandits in business. Austin Dennis sending this one out to right center field. It will be tracked down, but Romero Rodriguez is going to run on in and score, giving the Bandits a 1-0 lead. And, well, the Bandits had it all going. Cesar Salazar, nice grab. The out at first, the throw to Gray Kessinger. We got a rundown. No, we just got a tag. That's a double play. Bandits get the job done. They win it one nothing. They finish up 16 and five against teams from the Eastern Division. Lumber Kings come up with a win on the road four to at Lansing. Bees fall at Great Lakes seven to six. Cardinals in Pittsburgh this evening. And how about Matt Wieters? How about this for a home run? That is. Like long gone. That is out of there. And the Cardinals with a one nothing lead uh, did not take long for the Pirates to tie it up. Colin Moran with the base hit. This game would go to extras tied it two, And then it was a monster 10th inning as the Cardinals would come up with a grand slam and win this one six to five. Cubs lead three two. They are in the sixth now in San Francisco and the White Sox all over the Marlins 9-1 the final this evening on the south side. A lot going on for sure. You got it. Thanks Jay. We are following that developing story out of Davenport, the village of East Davenport. Police are at the scene there. We're invest looking live at the village there. What we're learning about the case coming up for you on Local 4 News at 10.
one, two, mic check. Mic check, one, two. Hello, hello, hello. WHBF is local for Davenport and local for you. This is Local 4 News at 10. Welcome back. We continue to follow breaking news out of the village of East Davenport. Police are at a home where two bodies have been pulled from a pool. Local force Grace Runkle joins us live again from the scene there. Grace, what can you tell us? Jim, we have just learned from police that it was two adult men that they found dead in a pool in the back of this house just before nine o'clock tonight. This is still very much an active scene. We have a crime scene unit here and there are five other police cars here. Investigators have been focusing on the alley leading back to the pool. We've seen them taking pictures back there. We've seen a lot of camera flashes going off. And as we were saying, this is still a very active scene and detectives are still back there. They're not not releasing a lot of other information right now because they don't know a lot of other details. But like I said, we just found out it was two adult men that they found in the bottom of a pool at this house here on Jersey Ridge Road and 11th Street. We're going to continue to follow this story and bring you all the latest updates. But for now, live in Davenport, Grace Runkle, Local 4 News. Grace, thanks for that update there in Davenport for us this evening.